Welcome everyone to another community call where uh, today we're going to talk about SciCon. So uh, Ricardo, take it away. Okay, so hi everyone. This is the, the first day after our first successful event. So first of all, thank you again to everyone who, who contributed and was in the audience. It was really nice to, to see all of you and it, it was just incredible how we put this together in the past couple of months. It's been really a pleasure um, for me and I, I hope really uh, for you as well to have all of the amazing speakers that we had on, on Research Hub. So I, I really hope we can continue on like, kind of like uh, on this uh, path, kind of like leading to another maybe event in, uh, in, I don't know, next, you know, two or three months. But for now, I think, you know, it's, uh, we had our time to celebrate, it's now time to, to, get, to get some feedback. So uh, yeah, I would start with what went well, what do you think what did not uh, go well? Let's start from the positive side. What do you think guys? Uh, went well with with this event. So one thing, Ricardo, this is this is kind of awesome. I think actually, um, I got guilt tripped yesterday uh, for not inviting um, like someone from the DSI community who we probably should have invited. And I was just thinking, like, y you know, I think we were like didn't totally expect to have the response that we actually got from speakers. So we, we aim to like achievable, you know, people rather than thinking of like, who's the best possible people we could get in here. And so, yeah, like the community, I guess the wider DSI community kind of expected that we could do that. And I think they were so impressed with the lineup that was there that like, you know, we were getting criticism for not thinking more broadly. So. Yeah, I think that's a huge compliment, actually, for being the first event. So yeah, I think the speakers were super great. Yeah, I think that's that's really awesome. That's actually one of the the best compliments that we could have got. You know, people wanting to you know participate and people thinking like you know you should have got this one and this you know, this this other person here. So well, that means we already have an action for the next one. You know, should hire and get more people maybe. Uh, if I can give a feedback myself, we should probably extend the, the slot because people like to talk, especially about this, you know, really interesting topic. So we, we will definitely extend the talk to at least uh, 30 minutes for everyone for the next event. And what do you think? Uh, should we go for a three? Because, you know, Psycon started as a one week event. We were like, you know, thinking big is like, OK, we're going to do this like one week long and maybe segment all the talks. And then we kind of like, we we're like, okay, this is the first one. We should probably aim for something smaller. And we kind of like compacted that into a weekend. So next time, if we had to do it again, would you, and let's say we have more speakers, would you go on a three day or would you still keep the two day during the weekend and kind of like extend the timing? Because I looked at the registration, uh, sorry, the, the recording, and they were like in between two and a half to three and a half hours. So maybe that could have been longer. I don't know. Just one of your feedback here. Um, well, I'm thinking that like, I mean, pretty big conferences like um, Psychonomics, for example, I think are just a weekend. Um, so I don't know if we need more days. Um, it's tough to say because like if we have more days, like are people really going to show up more days? You know, it's like people will probably show up for the ones they're interested in, just like at like psychonomics, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like by the end of many of these conferences, people are usually like conferenced out. Uh, I could be wrong, but that's kind of my opinion. Yeah, I agree, I agree. Edwin? I, I agree with Lynn. I think uh, like keeping scarcity when you have good, response is always like a good thing but are you guys thinking about doing it biannually or like what, what kind of time frame um for the next one do you think so Titan, uh if you ask me but then again we're a community so uh, we can even put that to a vote um i think Titan should be annual so we should have our event in i like actually the timing too uh, kind of like mid-july something that i said we should make sure we do not step on other people's toes so, for example, there was also uh, East uh, CC in Paris, and there was a DSI workshop there. So that kind of like probably eat out uh, some of the people. Um, so if we make sure we don't do that again next time, I think the timing July every year for Psycon is a good one. It makes people remember that we have Psycon at the same time of the year. It makes it a recurring thing, and I think it just looks good. And then we can have an alternate kind of like semesters. Uh, let's say in three, four months, we could have um, a different thing. So an hackathon. So 
So the next one could be a more practical thing when people get to code and get to work on practical things. So we alternate hackathons and conferences. Well, what about like, a, well, I mean, I, I don't know. It depends on resources, but like a grant uh, competition type thing where people write grants for the different types of research and we could have like, you know, some amount of money where there's a competition um, and uh, that would be the award. So similar to the ELN, but more detailed and people would actually like be way more incentivized to pre present their research. Yeah, I mean, that's a possibility. I'm less entitled to talk probably here, Patrick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a great idea when if we end up shipping some kind of like a grant feature, having like a marketing event around it where there's like a competition. I, I think that's a great idea. And we could probably put something together where we already have a few like like grantors who are willing to like supply that, you know, pot of tokens or cash or whatever. But yeah, I think I think we that that might be the order of operations there might be like MVP testing a grant feature, actually like getting to like building it. And then once we have it like built out, have that be like our kickoff, like launch, you know, I think marketing event. Hi, uh, Jeff. So, yeah, Jeff. Yeah, I think um, if you wanted to go for like, say, more speakers, say we had kind of an influx of really quality speakers and we want all of them, uh, I think instead of extending it out to like a four day event or something or a three, four day event, um, we had a pretty short, I mean, like the first day was only three hours long. I think we can extend the length of time per day. But if we do decide to do that, um, to make sure to include breaks in between. Um, so like usually every two to three speakers, you include like a little 10 to 15 minute break. Um, and I think that'd be probably a better way to go than to have like a four day thing where it bleeds into the weekday and then people's like work life takes over and stuff like that. What about a two weekend kind of thing? So we kicked it off actually Friday, uh, last Friday, no, the, the Friday before. Um, so we could have had that on two weekends, let's say. If, uh, but Matt, that's maybe too scattered. I don't know. That could be another idea. One thing I was thinking that would have been nice is like if it's a, a content creation type of thing where people are supposed to be working during the week in the background. Um, like maybe like every night at a regular time, there's two talks. So like Monday evening, there's two talks, Tuesday evening, there's two talks, Wednesday evening, there's two talks. And then there's like the actual conference, you know, over the weekend, but like having a regular thing where, you know, there's some kind of content that justifies us pinging people saying, Hey, you registered for this, finish your, you know, like content, we're having a thing tonight, you know, like just to get in people's inboxes more. And then. Yeah, just in general, I think it's like easier for me personally to like have like an hour worth of content rather than like five or six hours. It can be a lot, like two days in a, in a row or something. But you should, yeah. another consideration would be if we uh, introduce more types of competitions where people would be a little bit more interactive with each other. So it would be fun to actually watch, right? So that we can have another third day with a completely different type of content where people present stuff, right? And we just sit there and watch uh, people present their ELN or posters or what, whatnot. Uh, I think it would be important to alternate content types between different days so that people don't get too fatigued. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Uh, so be, before we get into the competitions, just for, for the speakers, I was saying, I kind of like feel the, the same way. Uh, I kind of like get hard if the, the the day gets too long. So if we can keep the day kind of like short in, in the same way, maybe adding some breaks, extending the, the slots. And then if we get more speakers, uh, you know, planning to maybe do, maybe move some speakers that we think could suit more during the week, uh, having them during the week and then having some other speakers during the weekend. And uh, yeah, something that I wanted, uh, wanted to say is I really appreciate it because uh, I see Cole here. I really liked his uh, talk, and I think this this is something that we should do as a community for the next event. We should have more people like Cole uh, presenting. Maybe this is something that could go, for example, during the week. And it's like, hey, I'm a research job member, and you know, apart from what I do on research job and during my my kind of like research during the day, this is a passion I have, and I think this kind of like uh, helps accelerate science in some way. So I really like that initiative, and I really hope that we can. Uh, do that again for for the next one uh molik 
Yeah, one thing that occurs during academic conferences, which sometimes if we have a lot of speakers we can do is we can have two talks go on concurrently, you know, and people can pick and choose what they go to. And I mean, eventually these are recorded. So like, you know, people can listen into the other one too. Uh, but if, if we have, you know, have a situation where we have a lot of speakers and we want to accommodate all, and you can have two of them go concurrently. Yeah, that, that could be another solution. Uh, I think that's debatable. Like that, that depends on the person. Like, kind of, like I don't remember me when I was going to festivals and I had like two stages of DJs that I really liked and I did not know what to decide in between the two. So that sometimes can get, can get tough if you want to kind of like listen to both of the talks and they are at the same time. You either decide to listen to one after you get the recordings or you cannot really attend both in live. But that could definitely be a solution if we get, you know, a lot of speakers and we cannot fit them in all in a week. Uh, that's definitely something that we, uh, we should, we should uh, consider. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, Joanna? Yeah. So. Um, I think the weekend schedule was kind of overwhelming in the sense that maybe some people had to sense that they have to give a part of their free time to to participate to Cycon. And uh, I really like what Patrick said, like um, to prepare next time the the participants in the sense to pinch them to participate. Like, look, this is the task. This is the main theme of the competition. So maybe you would like to participate. And if people like video content so much, I mean, I personally liked call ideas with interacting with videos and content creation for research. Maybe it could be something related to that. I mean, uh, for example, Jeffrey, started to post a video and it was very interesting, but maybe something interactive live to connect the research with with the video content. And uh, um, also in this way, with the grants idea, maybe we can like attract persons from universities or from laboratories who are very committed to to present the research? Yeah, I really like agree with you. Uh, I think you know the, this was the V one of the competition. So uh, yeah. if there's a, I, I feel like it could have been more interactive. So I you know I agree with you. We will we can definitely do better in that regard for for the next one. And at, for what you said about the weekends and the weekday. We kind of like debated that for, for some time. Uh, it was two months ago when we were deciding when to do Cycon and we were really debated, do we do this over the weekend and kind of like eat up some of the free time of people maybe during, during vacation or I don't know, or do we, that, do, do we do that during the week and eat up some of the work that, so my idea was if you have free time and you want to participate, you can do that. If you have work, you probably cannot. So that's why we decided to go for the weekend. But that, that's a good point that you raised. Uh, some people may just not be interested to spend their time during the weekend. So, but that's a tough one. We'll have to decide something. Yeah. So maybe maybe there's a way in between. I don't know. Yeah, they could make time uh, for Cycon. As long as they're making time for other hackathons, they could make time for Cycon also to yeah, hopefully. Yeah, I also wanted to add, Ricardo, um, I think that like, so we had some KPIs that we set, um, which was, if I remember correctly, like 25 people to register for the ELN competitions or the competitions. And then um, I think like 100 people to attend the conference. And at least based off of the people who registered, we went above that. So we had like 30 or 40 people register for the competitions and then um, for, 45 for the present your research and 41 for the ELN. So we almost doubled that. Yeah, so the that was like pretty great to see. And then the um, amount of audience members that registered was like 140 or something like that. Um, and we were aiming for 100. So I know not that many people participated in the competition, um, but at least people that were expressing some kind of interest and for whatever reason didn't end up doing it. I thought that was like really exciting to see. 
Yeah, it was really exciting to track that, uh, track that day by day. So uh, the, this week I'll go over some of the analytics and I will provide you with some more data next, next, next week. But uh, I think there could be something there where we analyze, for example, why we had such a bad uh, kind of like conversion rate from people that register into actually people that submitted. But that's something that we want to, to, to work on for kind of like the, the next iteration. Um, okay, any other thoughts on this? I think a, a oh. lot of say was um, like the social media, I think was like um, on another level kind of compared to like what we've been doing in the past. And so I think it's exciting to get a lot more like social exposure out uh, as opposed to kind of like, it's important I think to build kind of, you know, stealth mode. Um, but I think when you do an event, you really want to be kind of outward facing. So I thought that we did a pretty wonderful job on that front. And um, we've been incorporating um, UTMs on like a lot of the links now for um, the different social medias. So we'll have analytics on exactly where a lot of the user base is coming from. And we can kind of lean into that a lot more now. So I think going forward, we have a lot more tools that came out of this event that'll um, kind of set us up and posture us much better for the future. Yeah, and I think we need to continue to press on with the social media stuff. I don't think we should, you know, step back and wait for another conference or anything like that. We're, we're planning to do so. Yeah, we're planning yeah. to to keep to keep the the same level uh, leading to to the other one. I think the social media game was really good this time. Yeah. Uh, that was also probably due to my twenty five followers, but you know that could also. Be <laughs> <laughs> well, especially but, uh, the only feature coming up. I don't know how long we're thinking, but I, I think we should definitely you know lean into that. But. Sorry, uh, which one? With the bounty feature coming up? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, absolutely. A, that's actually shipped on last Friday. We have like a question and answer bounty, and then we'll add like bounties for peer review and like bounties for summaries of paper uh, sometime this week. Okay. Well, we need to. Okay. I mean, okay, so how. Wait, that shipped last Friday? I, I didn't even see that. Like, yeah, we haven't done like any like content about it yet, but if you go to Research Hub's homepage, um, there's a new like post type. If you go to the top right corner, um, I can just walk through it if you want. Maybe, maybe I'll do that at the end of the Psycon stuff. We'll demo the the new question and answer feature. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Hey, yeah, just in continuing the conversation about social media, do you think that, that it would be possible to maybe like there was the slide for where you could join live on Research Hub's website? But do you think it would also be beneficial to do or to do like audio only on Twitter, for example? So it's, there's a Twitter space of what's going on. Uh, you can do the same sort of thing with Instagram and you can do Facebook or Facebook Live and uh, YouTube Live as well, just to increase exposure. If that's something that's uh, interesting for people. I mean, I could probably do Facebook Live through my uh, or sorry, not Facebook. I could do YouTube live through my YouTube channel as well, just as a demo. You're talking in the in the context of an event or in general, as a let's say general practice. In the context of an event in particular. Okay, so for the event, uh, we kind of like um, played a bit with the um, simultaneous live stream, thanks to Sadvik that I see here in the audience. We kind of like thought about uh, doing that for the first time with this event, and we streamed that first to YouTube. Then they kind of like you know closed our <laughs> account. Now we got it back, so we can do it again. But uh, we also streamed through uh, Vmail, so that is possible. We can live stream uh, on the at the same time while we're doing the Zoom call. Um, with the Twitter Spaces, I think there's some potential there. For example, in like uh, we now have all the transcript, like the the recordings of the talks. So we could, uh, for example, think about playing that. Uh, you know, segmenting all of the talks, and we can have even like individual uh, uh, kind of like uh, users um, opening a Twitter space for for something, and yeah, to uh, Facebook Live as well. So I think there's definitely some potential, and in general, the more engagement that we can create coming from the community is always a good thing. On on that note, because the conference was recorded, is the plan to break that up into several pieces of content specifically for Research Hub? Because we've done the con because the conference is done, you could break up, like you were saying, each talk into individual pieces and then post those on Research Hub just so that way people can view it if they miss the conference. 
Yes, 100%. Cole, if you have any interest in like helping out with that, if you've done that before, it would, would be amazing. Um, the, the other thing too is I totally agree that we should be like streaming through every avenue possible. Um, when we did AMAs before, we used, I forget what the name of the tool was, but it was like a live streaming like website, uh, like crowd something, I forget what it is. But um, we actually got like a decent amount of signups through that platform just because like they do some of the discovery, you know, for you. So yeah, I think like as many platforms as we can have discovery, like opening the funnel wide to have people come in, uh, we'll get more attendance, more people like actually caring about Research Hub. So yeah, the next event, let's totally do that. Like let's get in as many platforms as we can just to, to help the numbers out. I think well, it's where, stream live on, on LinkedIn. It's something that I was thinking about. That's totally a good idea. That. Totally do that. Yeah. That's a good idea. So where are the videos of all the talks and everything from um, from Psycon? They're in processing. Oh, they're now processing. we have all of the yeah, we have all of the recordings. We have to kind of like cut the the, the beginning and the end, but we're gonna put uh, we'll put them out uh, soon. Okay. But yeah, we're processing them. Yeah, if you need some help with that, like I'm proficient in video editing. So that's no, hundred percent. Thank you. Thank you. It's yeah. awesome. Uh, uh, Sadvik, Joanna, I don't know who was first. Um, uh, along with Cole's idea, maybe we can do a freemium free feature. I mean, in time, for example, how Spotify does three months uh, free, free, and after you pay, I don't know, five dollars or how much is the subscription, and in this way there are lots of incentives to participate also maybe for universities let's say if their content is protected or there are some property rights i mean maybe we can do some collaboration along with that and i think for example persons like Cole who work a lot they could be rewarded and then other artists or like content creators could be interested into this yeah, that's that's a great idea. That's a great idea. And if if anyone has any insight into how to possibly do this, uh, please reach out because we might uh, definitely consider this for for the next event. Um, Sadvik. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I might. Uh, what I'm going to say might already be in motion, and I might just not be in the loop. Uh, so I think that uh, for the upcoming events, we could have better post event marketing, wherein. Uh, We've collected all of these emails and what do we do with them now so that they end up turning into active community members instead of just fizzling away. So I think that should be something that uh, we really carefully plan out for the next event. Right. I get that we didn't have enough time to do it this time around. Uh, yeah. So that's one thing. And also, I absolutely love uh, Patrick's idea of having uh, sort of little talks all through the week. I think. Uh, uh since we'll have this since we'll most likely definitely have more speakers coming up uh spreading it throughout the week so that it becomes sort of a, a part of people's daily schedules for an entire week i think that would be really great to improve our retention rates uh after the event is done Sadik, to, to jump in two really quick um one, one thing that we've been like kind of perplexed by is we have just atrocious um email marketing stats like we're way below benchmarks on email opens and like clicks. And so I don't know if that's just like our clientele doesn't respond well to email marketing or like if there's something wrong with our copy. So if that's something that you're into, like we're, we're kind of like a little bit confused why our stats are so low. So would would love to like work with you on improving it. I think it's because we, it gets a listen into my uh, Gmail uh, inbox. It, it goes into promotions. That's right. So my my best friend also was not able to get it. Like it, it did not see the email because it was in the promotions. And most of the time you don't check the promotions, unfortunately. So if there's a way to get into the general the, the the main folder, that would I think like at least double or triple the the open the the clicks. We could just remind people to green light it. That would probably make a difference. Yeah, kind yeah. kind of an aside though. We we probably need to do like another call at some point focused on that just to to you don't actually take more advantage of it, but I'll, I'll coordinate with you, Safi. Okay. Mm, I, I, um, usually people uh, get the direct mails when they subscribe. So for example, if we'll have a, a blog 
or journal posting or like some stories on the research hub um, main page, it will be different because for the moment, nobody knows our product and what it's about. So we should like advertise in some way. Yeah, I think there's plans to do some more uh, blogs, some more articles. So I think this event really kickstarted some more things that will come. So I let's see. We'll test with many things and see what sticks and what uh, gets more people on on board because that's that's the end goal. Uh, okay, so uh, it's already yeah almost uh, half an hour. Let's switch to the uh, the most interesting part, the, the negative side, because that's where we learn from. So uh, what did not go as well that you would have liked to to see better for next time? And be honest, please. Leon. So yeah, I think it kind of like the other side of the positive thing is that like clearly we have like a little bit of clout and we can attract, you know, pretty good speakers. So so maybe next time thinking of like uh like tearing out potential speakers of like dream level, like here's who we should reach out to first, you know, and like yeah, just tearing it out where we take shots at really, really, you know, hard to get people and then kind of like filter down and figure out exactly, um, you know, who we can get to attend these kinds of events and like how much value it is to be associated with Research Hub's brand kind of. Yeah. I think um, also having more people who signed up for the EL1 competition actually participating uh, would have been good. We might have not been clear enough about what the, the, the competition was. Um, I don't know. I, I get that feeling too, but yeah. at the same time, like the 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 submissions that I saw were on point. Like we're, we're good. Totally. So the people that actually submitted submitted good content. Mm -hmm. So that makes me wonder what uh, we exactly did wrong there. Could could have been communication, probably like people at a first sight. Maybe you know people that wanted to was really interested into the the, the competition. Maybe had those five minutes more to go through the rules and be like, okay, this is actually doable in, I don't know, like a couple hours, let me do this. But people that were there to just see like this, is this something I can do? They were probably not getting that at first sight. So this is where we should probably improve. I think that's, that's my understanding of the situation here. Maybe yeah. we should also give the opportunity to submit using different types of media. Cause like writing it out is, you know, quite difficult for some people, maybe, I don't, I don't know, so just a thought, but, um, you know, yeah. I could imagine someone wanting to do something equivalent to a lecture um, and submitting that, and that might be something that you know some people might prefer. So. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That's true. We cannot like put it in in a way that it was like a submission. So we cannot allow to uh, include videos and images too. Like for example, uh, Todd's uh, submission was really great in the way he explained the concept mm -hmm. because he put a text images and an explanatory video. That was perfect in, in the That's sense that, exactly. So mm -hmm. people could have done that, but as you said, in it seemed by, you know, if you're coming from, from, from outside of research shop, it really seems like you have just made an article. So that was probably, you know, yeah, making it a little bit, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, too much of a, too much of a the burden to, to, to take on a weekend. So um, yeah, I don't know, that, that, that could be an explanation, definitely. Malik? Yeah, um, so first of all, yeah, thanks for putting all the efforts for the cycle. It was overall great. This is a, in a way minor, but in a way um, kind of important to have it look like the conferences, like, you know, professional grade is like, so like the first talk, you know, when Brian Armstrong was, um, you know, talking with you guys, you and Patrick, uh, you know, the interface kind of stuck on for a while. And then, you know, there was some lag in the, talk and stuff so when like somebody important like him is there like you know maybe like have the best background like you know it's seamless and stuff uh it's a small thing i mean you guys put a lot of effort so i appreciate that but just because if, if we are making this like you know big then um you know uh somebody important needs to have like all the best attention and stuff so yeah Yeah, I agree. I agree. We had a couple, a couple issues there, uh, but uh, you know, somehow we still managed to, to at least you know, get some content out. I think that's still a positive side of that. I agree that you know, it was a little clunky. Uh, it was not the best talk, uh, but we should. Uh, we will definitely. I think here a common ground for all of the negative things is just in, the, in general, like more planning. I kind of like gave myself a two months uh, 
time that, that I worked to, to, to work on this, I started working on this was actually a little bit more. It was like uh, beginning of June. So it was more like, a, sorry, beginning of May. So it was like two months and a half. But probably a three month schedule is safer uh, to, to get through this uh, in a way that is everything is more organized. And uh, yeah, more like, uh, yeah, we should have planned that better. But, uh, you know, it's, it, we'll, we'll get it. We'll get it better next time. This yeah, you'll have a better forward. sense of delegation next time too. So, I mean, yeah, it'll be really good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not yeah. not a huge deal. I just oh, I was just discussing because you know we wanted to talk about if there were any issues. So yeah. Uh, oh, I don't know who was first. Uh, Cole. Yeah. Uh, so just really bu building off Malik's point, like maybe doing a dry run with all of the presenters before the speaking block to make sure that people are already signed in, ready to go. Because I know that there was some interruption for Ariella and the Women in Web3 panel, just to kind of avoid situations like that. Basically, just get everybody quick on yeah, at once. That, that was a really last minute, if not into the minute, uh, kind of issue. Uh, and I just literally saw the message like a couple of seconds before. So I had to introduce it very brief. So, yeah, as you said, that's also another. Uh, we hit a uh, little bumps there, but um, yeah, we'll definitely do better. Absolutely. Jeff? Yeah, so, so I think just to jump in here, one thing which is like a little bit of a challenge is like, especially if we try to aim for like really prestigious speakers, like their their time is valuable. And so sometimes it's hard to be like, hey, like come show up early in order to like, you know, tech check things like um, so trying to figure out how we can do that without necessarily like using the speaker's time, I think would be a valuable like uh if that's even possible um you know thing to look into by the way did we reach out to balaji to be a speaker not not for this time i i, I kind of figured like for the first time we're just going to see how it goes you know yeah. and i think i think now that like that was at least in my estimation like really really well done for, yeah. for the first time and so now that we know we can do that i think it makes sense to go full speed ahead for the next one for sure yeah one quick suggestion maybe for the speakers, if you, taking up some of their time is an issue, maybe uh, for the Zoom call, having a breakout room where people can people that are presenting can join first and do like a mic check. Just, so, just that way yeah, that's we, right and ready to go. We we had that for, for the Zoom. Uh, and that again, depends on when the speaker joins. Sometimes the speakers joins uh, one minute before, two minutes before, five minutes. So you get a little bit more time. Uh, for uh, with Tushar, for example, he joined a couple, like, uh, I think it was like exactly like five minutes before as we asked. So we got a, a lot of time to uh, present him. Jeff did a great job on presenting to Shar. And, you know, I kind of like really enjoyed it, the, the talk myself. And also I think it, it's kind of like part of it because you get the time to introduce, uh, you know, the speaker. So, yeah, once, once again, I, I agree with you, Cole. Jeff? Yeah, I think actually one time Balaji was, I think you it, did an AMA with him, right, Patrick? Like a year or so ago. Um, so yeah, I think that'd be cool to have them on board next time. Um, I think one thing that we should definitely include to ease the mind of people who are trying to join the competitions, and I think we should do this for other things too, which is put like a time commitment estimation. So if we want the community to get involved in anything, we should like bold, like, hey, 20 minute commitment. And if you're going to do the competition, bold two hour commitment because some people will read something and they'll think, oh, that's so daunting. I have to spend six hours to do this. But if they see that it's a short time commitment, I think people will get will, will be more inclined to be involved. Also, like kind of one thought I had with the with the content production, like for, for people here who wrote uh, blogs, like how long did it take you? Because like my own experience, I like blocked out three days of two hours at the end of the day to write it. And I got like three quarters of the way through a blog without editing, you know, like definitely was not ready for public consumption. And so I almost think if we want to do something like this for the next time, like a month, you know, to be like, you can start writing or like start collaborating with people, start submitting a month beforehand just to, to really spread it out. Cause yeah, you got to spend a decent chunk of time of your week, you know, to do it all in seven days. 
Oh, yeah, in that way, it will be closer to traditional conferences, right? They have a long call to action window where you can uh, submit your stuff. Yeah, I agree. We, we, we should definitely expand a bit the, the window. That again was, I think, uh, kind of like a, a consequence of a little bit of bad timing in, in like, but for myself, uh, in like giving, you know, the overall length of the schedule. Uh, but uh, yeah, we should definitely extend uh, a little bit more the, the time for the people to submit. Mm, uh, Patrick's uh, idea about blogs. Uh, some users, especially uh, Web3 users, are um, incentivized by bounties. So maybe we can do some bounties for the blog post also. And related to the uh, prestigious speakers' ideas, um, I mean, I like this this idea, but like to be something different, we should not place the attention on the prestigious uh, speaker, and we should place the attention like on the person who submits and who participates in the competition, because this could be counterintuitive to advertising, but like the best advertising is done by users and by persons who want to uh, grow research and yeah so it's awesome that the prestigious speaker will will talk but like yeah the main idea should be on what this conference should aim at and i think research it's yes Okay, so just just to repeat it back, you think like you know uh, users should be more in the you know kind of like in the in the spotlight and having mm -hmm. less you know kind of like the speakers in the background being like kind of like a, a side of the the conference. Let's say we have this competition. This is what is the conference is about, and then we also have some speakers giving some talks. Yeah, I get I get your point. I think it's important to emphasize you know even uh, taken as an example our first icon event, uh, the the speakers part went great. The part that didn't go so well uh, were probably the competitions. So we'll do a better job in, you know, making sure next time we have a more of a balanced situation in between uh, emphasizing the, the people that submit and the users and uh, the speakers that we also uh, hope to have, you know, some amazing speakers. So um, I think just to, to dig into this idea a little bit too, because I, I do think like one thing we've been thinking about with Research Hub is how to increase our prestige and become like more attractive to like the average academic. And I do think part of that is being associated with like big name scientists, you know, whether it's through speaking slots or stuff like that. So I think there's actually a lot of value in marketing the speakers initially. But Joanna, you have a great point where like the best advertising comes from users being genuine. So like, I think we should probably hit up everybody who submitted to the competition, who's not like a, like a regular part of like Research Hub's like community and um, just talk to them. And then maybe even eventually like they'd be willing to do like a 30 second quick video of like what they enjoyed about it, you know, what they like about Research Hub. And then we can publish video content like of actual users talking about like why they enjoyed participating in SciCon kind of thing. I know uh, like Molecule does some of these videos and they're like super well produced and stuff, but I always find them pretty compelling. But you want to be right, like taking some of the positive experiences and creating marketing materials out of them, I think would be like pretty compelling. Yeah. That's epic. Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, in addition to the previous point, those uh, marketing videos could also, uh, we could also incentivize or just ask uh the people to share it on their own personal platforms right and not make it look like super well uh super well polished so that it still looks organic and it uh that way it can reach further into their own private uh networks right uh also uh the original point that i had to make was that uh this is specifically about our twitter strategy uh so the tweets that we put out were uh almost all of them were linking to something else right or they were uh, they had uh, an image of the speaker right uh, and i am i am uh, in dsi and like i'm supposed to know more uh, some of those people but uh, if i was if i didn't know about research up beforehand it wouldn't have interested me 
uh, as speaking as a customer so what would have been more interesting would have been uh, threads uh, uh, threads that would have informed me about why that topic matters so like two uh, three to four tweets that could simply point out the problem that uh, that this talk could help solve and then a link to it so that could have increased my chances of clicking on it significantly as opposed to uh, seeing just a photo of the speaker and not having any clue uh, who those who he or she is so that is one uh, sort of feedback i had or we could just get stoop dog shout us out on twitter <laughs> <laughs> let's change his name to like science dog or something like that <laughs> yeah that's a good point Satvik. actually like i remember reading a, a tweet thread on like how to retain like users and how to like onboard like a large quantity of users and the biggest thing that it said was like provide free information to people because it's one thing to like kind of shill a project or shill a person but when you provide free um, information about something um the person gets value out of that for not inputting anything themselves, and they're more likely to come back to seek more information from the platform itself. So it's a good point. We can even probably put this onto the speakers to say, hey, we want to market your stuff. Why does your talk matter? Like, just tell us why, and we'll translate it into tweets for you. Yeah, I think that's the way to do it because, um, like, I was spread pretty thin across a bunch of stuff, and like, I was the one writing a lot of the social media content, and. Um, it would have been way too daunting to like be able to do that on top of like all the other stuff. So I think if we put the ball in the court of the speaker, uh, they can probably hype it up more than like somebody else can, you know? So that's a good idea. I'll write that down. Yeah, cool. Yeah, definitely getting the speakers to write their own social media content, I think is a great idea because then it's less work on people here, and they can, and the speakers can then communicate the ideas they specifically want. Uh, but I was going to go uh, really talk about the ELN submissions. I found that because I'm no longer in academia, and the science that I work on is proprietary for my company, I can't say like, "Hey, this is what I'm working on," because I'm legally bound to not tell people. Uh, is it possible to have? another competition for perhaps uh, summarizing or submitting any science, not just the science that you're doing. That way you can get other people creatively coming up with ideas like presentations, posters, whatever, to submit and just capture more of an audience outside of uh, academia. Cool, we should totally just start building this community of like, like uh, people who wanna create scientific videos, because I see something like really valuable in the future where authors pay content creators to make videos about their papers and it's like a win-win-win where it's like uh, more layman friendly the author gets more citations you know like more people see their paper like and to do that we need to build a community of these creators so yeah i think i think we need to definitely put some effort into this and it, it could be like really really valuable for research hub if we're able to get you know five ten people who want to fulfill those kinds of bounties. Well, especially with uh, science content creators who are sort of on your level, Cole, who aren't like huge already and could use more of the audience, I think that that there might be like more room for cooperation there. Yeah, because there's a there's a handful of people. There's Eleanor Shiki, which already po she posts here. There's somebody on YouTube uh, called Boomy at the Benchtop. His stuff, I haven't gone. It's not quite the same, but it's still science related content. Yeah that he doesn't have a huge audience. Yeah. But I think would be interested in doing that as well. But yeah, I agree. Like getting a core group of people that want to create science content would be would do wonders. Yeah. Sapic has an amazing point. Like I'm sitting here reading abstracts like it's 1995. Like like it's time to to move to video content. Like I yeah. I think that could be so compelling for people. Mhm. Mm Hundred percent. Like I think uh, I've been, you know, hyper bullish on scientific uh, influencers. Like really, I think like the the evolution of science will come from people that are able to effectively communicate science and get other people hyped about what they do. Because I realized that myself when I was at the, the beginning of my my research and I was telling to people what I did. It was like, yeah, 
not really interesting. But then I tried to get a little bit better and I got more people in, into it. And I was like, okay, that's kind of cool. I mean, you can solve these problems and this, this and that. So again, if you can get some of these micro influencers, some research job, they could do a play a big role into kind of like, you know, starting this. Even and, larger influencers like Dr. Nock. And depends on if, we, if we can get them. <laughs> Really and, yeah, reach out to so many of them, uh, and it's and also just like depends on the structure of what you you offer, right? So the ones that did respond, when we talked about something akin to uh, an editorship, it was just not something. It's just kind of weird, you know. They they are used to people hitting them up and just paying them for featuring them in their video, so it's it's like a little bit of a throw off. Um, so maybe we want to think about what kind of. Um, compensation structures or not i don't like compensation structure i like involvement structure more than anything especially at this stage that would uh, be most appealing to somebody who's a relatively large science communicator if you can move the competition on research hub and create a sort of like reputation system where these influencers kind of like compete to be the best on research hub that creates a positive effect where people want to share more and because they want to be on research up they want to be on the top like we have a leaderboard now for uh, users we could have the same for content creators and you know cold video got played 500 times in the past week and then we have jab videos that got played a thousand times so th there could be something really positive here you know for research up but in general for like the communication of science i think yeah. there's really something big here yeah, I'll, I'll put this on an action item to schedule another call because I think we should probably do like half an hour just dedicated to getting the wheels, you know, put in motion on this. Because, yeah, I totally agree with everybody here. I think this would be very, very cool. Yeah, sorry, Patrick. Uh, you want to go over the, um, the, the the bounty feature? We have 10 minutes left. I don't want to eat up some some more time. Uh, yeah, just totally. tell me what you want to do. Yeah, it should, it should only take five minutes to do that. So I guess, like, any final thoughts on SciComm before we wrap up? Any, like, last feedback from anybody? Good, bad, could be better? Maybe something. Should we open up a uh, channel where you put in feedbacks, or just reach out to me? Whatever. If you find there's a place where you would like to put in some feedbacks, I think maybe you think about what is what, what we said today, and something comes up tomorrow. If you want us to create a place where we put the feedbacks, or maybe just reach out to to us individually. Uh, I think whatever works, but whatever is you know most uh, comfortable for you. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, so any other last thoughts here before we move on to the bounties feature? Cool. So I'll share my screen. We can go see this. And then uh, this was shipped on Friday, and I think it's like actually one of our better uh, new shipping. Sorry, this is miserable. I gotta log into my thing. Apologize. Um, like I think we did a pretty good job with this V1. So curious uh, to hear what everybody thinks. Just give me one second. I apologize. Okay. Yeah, so um, the way this works is we have a new post type, which is ask a question. So you go to new, um, ask a question, and uh, there can be a title of a question. So um, does the Earth orbit the sun question? Um, you can add information to like uh, uh, add additional context to your question in case anybody needs it. And then you can post it in a specific hub, so astrophysics. When you ask the question, it shows up as like a, a new post. Um, if I want to add a bounty to this, I can add a research coin bounty. So say I want to add like 100 research coin. Um, I put it in there. There's a 9% fee, two of which goes to the Research Hub community's multi-sig, and seven of which goes to Research Hub Inc. as revenue. Um, so the final uh, total ends up being 9% plus like the additional bounty that I wanted to put like into the post. Um, two little uh, important details here. Uh, the bounty ends in 30 days or as soon as you accept an answer. And then um, as soon as you press add bounty, the fee is gone. So if you end up canceling it later, um, it's already been distributed to Research Hub and the Research Hub community. So I go in here and I add bounty. Uh, now my bounty has been added to this question. I can share on Twitter if I want to uh, share on Twitter, or I can copy the URL to send to any of my friends that I think uh, it would apply to. 
And so now that I have this bounty, um, I can either ask a clarifying question. Um, I can like comment on it if it's a comment, or I can try and answer it. And then um, once there's an answer, this is kind of tricky because I'm the same person answering and asking the question. Um, I can accept the answer to say this is the right answer and then award the bounty. And so that bounty, I just gave it to myself um, with the right answer here. So this is kind of like the, the overall of how the new question and answer um, like bounties work. Jeff had a great example earlier today. I guess I've got this here in the, in the chat. So we can see um, Jeff's example. I uh, put a thousand research coin bounty on a specific question uh, that he needs help with for his research. So again, like the, uh, the use case for this is gigantic. Like a question can be one of like, you know, you can phrase almost anything as a question, Jeopardy style. So yeah, excited to kind of see how people use this. And we can even do like, a, a, can you make a video uh, for this paper? You know, like bounties for that kind of thing can be done through like in a more bespoke fashion through this question and answer feature as well. So yeah, that's kind of like the, the overall. Um, any thoughts, questions, feedback here? I love the revenue feature is kind of functioning as a way to burn the tokens. So I love that, but it's like completely plausible from a legal perspective. Yeah, totally. So I mean, I think like Research Hub Inc. can't burn anything, but um, you know, the community can do whatever they want with their tokens. In theory, we'd have to run it past the lawyer, but um, yeah. So well, I'm saying that even the the tokens are going to Research Hub Inc. The fact that they're taken out of circulation. I mean, obviously you can put it in circuit in circulation, presumably some point much further in the future, um, but it's serving as a burning mechanism. And I think that's that's great that you can do it in a way that's plausibly legal. Yeah, I'm pretty excited to actually have some like, you know, financial value flowing through Research Hub. I think there's a lot of cool stuff that's gonna come out of this. Yeah. Do we know um, anything about the legality of like sending things to like a dead wallet? Um, like, is that something that we can or can't do or? What? I'm not sure. I, again, like we're on like a recorded public call, so like right. I don't know, like <laughs> be too much about like what you're allowed to do and not. Um, Fair, it, yeah. It, I genuinely it, don't know, you know, what the you know what is typically allowed with that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. I think in general, burning is not a uh, great, but gotcha. Do it, so I'd have to talk to a lawyer to figure it out. Um, Jeff. Yeah, one thing that I think it's kind of a cool byproduct of it is that it's almost like like locking your rsc or it's like almost a pseudo staking feature mm -hmm. where your stuff is staked for up to 30 days so i think that's nice because it kind of helps retain a lot of the rsc on the platform even if there's like an open bounty but nobody takes it it's kind of nice because it keeps it sequestered in there i'd say the one thing that i would like kind of threw me off a little bit from the ui ux perspective was when i was initially typing in the title and the question I thought that that is where I was supposed to input the bounty. So I was typing that out and I was like, I don't see any option for me to put in the bounty. And I actually thought it was a bug. So I was like, I initially went on there, typed it out and I was like, oh, I guess it's a bug. It's not ready. I exited. And then I tried it again later and noticed that you had the bounty on the next screen. So I think if you include that in the first screen it would be super beneficial. Yeah, there's there's a lot of work that we need to do when it comes to like helping to make bounties more discoverable. Like even right now, Jeff, that was like exactly what we want people to use the feature and you can't tell from the homepage. So yeah, yeah I, I think like once it becomes more clear that you can do this kind of behavior, um, yeah, it, there's a lot of wrinkles that we need to work out. And I, I agree that having some indication of like you can add a bounty here on the first screen is probably important. Uh, or I mean, yeah. I mean like, um, sorry, I meant like on the screen where you're typing, like when you are the person that's submitting it, like on the homepage, of course, having a thing like an open bounties tab, but like the submitter on that first screen should know that that I feel it feels like you should be able to add the bounty on that screen, not the next screen after it's already been posted. It's it's a great point. I'll mention that to Kobe because I know there was like an intentional reason. It's modeled after Stack Overflow and how they do it, but I think Stack Overflow doesn't have it as part of their business model. And also it's like, it's reputation, like there's no financial value. So I think there's less 
you know, compelling reasons to add bounties on Stack Overflow. But it, it's a great point, Jeff, and I'll I'll relate to Kobe so that way he's aware. I just want to make a quick specification to Lean and to many persons that are asking about um, the thing about research coin. The fact that it's not traded and it's converted into Ethereum or other uh, uh, cryptocurrency, let's say, uh, it doesn't have the life on its own. So until research coin it's traded either on exchanges or other stuff. It's basically what the research community, this research research hub community gives sense to. So that's our value that is created in our community. Until it's not traded, we, we don't have that much concerns about other regulations. Yeah. I, so, so one thought that I had about um, Tushar's talk, uh, which was interesting, where he said denominate everything in USD, and you can have the token happening in the background. Jeff, like, is there any desire from your end, like, when you make that bounty, to have it be in a USD value and the research coin amount fluctuates? You know, where it's like you put fifty bucks on the bounty, and like the actual research coin, you know, is in question. Or, or like maybe there's a half step where the research coin is fixed, but like the US dollar value of that is a little bit more prominent from a UI perspective. Um, yeah, just I thought that I thought that point that Tushar like drilled home multiple times was interesting and applies to what we're doing now. The only yeah. issue with that though is like if we chose the one where the dollar was like fixed and the research coin fluctuated what if it somehow fluctuated to the point where the person couldn't pay the bounty or like was no longer willing to pay the bounty it seems like having the research coin fixed and showing the dollar amount would make more sense it'd be tricky yeah i'm not, yeah. I'm not sure how to do it the best way but just interested if we should start thinking about that potentially probably well, we could have a, a dynamic bid process or something like that if we wanted to do a research coin and show the equivalent in um dollars and then people who are interested could potentially say okay i'd be willing to do it for this amount or something like that i think that'd be like a more feasible way of doing it other than just because if you just have research coin in the background um there's um that kind of takes away from the primacy of the coin to the platform and may actually like ultimately take away some of the value that can be accrued into the the market cap there so i think uh the visibility there is also important yeah but also like having the usd equivalent instead of having to like i find on research hub it's difficult to find how much a research coin is actually worth so i have to go through a couple steps, I actually have it bookmarked personally. So that way I can look at the chart to make a comparison for the people already just with the bounties would incentivize people to be like, oh yeah, that's worth $5 worth of my time if I know how, what the answer to that question is. Or like, I would actually really appreciate more for that type of request. Yeah. It's a great thought. I, I know like there is there's like some legal consideration to having the USD prices, but I know a lot more projects are doing it now than we're doing it, you know, maybe three or four years ago. So um yeah, we'll have to look into it to to make sure that we can do that. But I know Brian's wanted to do that for a while and we've just been waiting until kind of the coast is clear. So yeah, I think we can definitely start to think about how we would do it um with this feature specifically. What is coast is clear? Legal. Guess we're <laughs> retiring or <laughs> no, we just don't get sued. I, I think <laughs> yeah, it's just there's an evolving understanding of what you can do to not violate securities regulations. Yeah. Safik. Yeah. Uh, personally, if I'm just uh, browsing bounties on maybe Dwork or some other DAOs, uh, and I come across a bounty in USD, it's uh, I'm much more likely to actually go ahead and check it out uh, as opposed to it's uh, as opposed to finding bounties that are a thousand of any random coin and then that I'm not aware of and then checking them out and then it turns out to be like one dollars worth like one or two dollars so that's uh, sort of disappointing so having them in USD could have this added benefit uh, also I had to ask do we plan to create some sort of an automated system wherein 
so uh, so for example if you asked uh, does the sun uh, does the earth revolve around the sun and you've added a thousand uh, rsc bounty to it do we uh, do we plan to incorporate something that automatically posts it to public uh, public sort of places like dwork uh, and in case we have that uh, then it would make even more sense to uh, at least show usd values in those public spaces and then maybe on rsc it could be on research hub it could be in rsc uh, for the reasons that edwin stated it's it's actually that's such a good idea sapic i don't know like i i might just be a, an old person now but when i was like looking for jobs and i was in grad school and stuff like uh, i would go to craigslist you know and i actually found like a couple jobs through craigslist so i bet it's very feasible for us to like cross post bounties to craigslist saying hey if you're a scientist you want to do a peer review like boom just all over craigslist um so that's a that's a super good idea and i think um would be good for v2 so I'll write that down and pitch it to Kobe and see if he's excited about it. Cool. Um, yeah, so we're a couple minutes over now, but any other last thoughts on the bounties feature? This has been great feedback so far. Thanks for everybody for being so excited about it. Yeah, I feel like we've been waiting for it for so long. No. I think it looks really good, by the way. Um, and I like the ability to immediately share it and copy the URL as well. Yeah, big, big time props to Kobe. Kobe led the development of this one and was really hands on. I think he did a great job. Even like, uh, I think it's a lot less buggy than some of our like normal uh, features that we ship. So I, I think he put a ton of work in. Um, yeah, and as Jeff said, like if you follow the GitHub, he's ship, shipping stuff all the time. So yeah, this is big time props to Kobe. So feel free to reach out to him and let him know that you enjoy it if, if you do. How do you access it, by the way, from the, like, I, you know, I, I see Jeff's link and everything, but is it, like, how do you do that? Is it just a post and then you click bounty or? So that's, that's something that we're going to ship later this week. Right now, it's just for the question type. So you have to start a new question from the homepage. This is, this is great to hear though, that it's not super obvious because we need to, we need to make it obvious for people. So you have to go to the homepage, click plus new. And then yeah. this question, and then ask a question, and then after that, you can add a bounty. Okay. Yeah, I think it definitely needs to be clear. But cool. yeah, V two, etc. Yeah, Sapic, we're gonna we're gonna add discovery to uh, like the the V two. We'll probably ship this by the end of not this week coming up, but the week after. And the idea there is on the homepage, you'll be able to browse open bounties somehow. We're also going to um, like start to create some just bespoke bounties paid by Research Hub. So if anybody has like a bounty they really want to fulfill, uh, let me know, and we'll have Research Hub pay for it. Um, the goal here is we want to have some like actual examples of bounties being answered, so that way I can cold email people and say, "Hey, here's how it works. Like, do you have any questions you want answered? Here's five thousand free research coin if you come and ask a question." So. If there's anything specifically, any content you want to make, let me know, and I'll I'll create a question and add a bounty to it. Cool. Yeah. Any any other last minute thoughts before we get out of here? Um, thanks again for all the feedback, all the energy, and Ricardo, like you're the man. Like unbelievable. I think how how well this event went. So yeah, super totally. beautiful. Like thanks for kind of you know taking the lead and picking up the slack when it needed to happen. It was yeah. I'm really blown away. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate this. And yeah. actually, you know, it, it just shows by the, you know, all of the passion that people put into this. So yeah, really happy for, for, for this event. Okay. Awesome. Awesome guys. Uh, yeah. See you next Very week. Excited. See you, buddy.